we recognize that you are in control and that we are not and that so many of these things are simply beyond our control, beyond our help, beyond our ability to do anything. And it's just a reminder that um, really we are frail. Our life is simply a vapor and we have no power except the power that you give us. In fact, the very breath that we have comes because of you. And so, Lord, we lift up these friends, these family members, these neighbors, and we ask that you would touch them, Lord, that you would heal them. We ask that you would, uh, that you would hold them with your righteous right hand, that they would know that they're not alone, but that you're walking there with them. And, and even when they ask, why is this happening to me? And sometimes, Lord, we know that you don't always answer the why questions, but you do answer the how, and the how is how you're going to use this for your glory, how you're going to use this to touch lives, to change our lives, Lord, to, to bring us to our knees in prayer and dependence on you. And we lift up Pastor Dave, and we pray your, your hand upon him as well, healing, restoring, protecting, sheltering, just bringing your peace. Thank you, Father, for our brother. Lord, we commit our, our time now, that time that we have in your word. Lord, we, we need you. <laughs> we, we need you not just for the healings that we've just been lifting up and uh, for your touch and your direction, but Lord, we need you. We need your Holy Spirit to illuminate your word, to help us to understand it. For this word is spiritually discerned. It is not um, by, by our wisdom that we can understand it, Lord, but by your wisdom, by your, by your spirit, Lord. So illuminate it. Speak to us, Father. We want to know you. We want to, we want to know your dwelling place. And we want to be drawn to you tonight. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We've been going through the book of Exodus on Wednesday nights. My dwelling place is the series and uh, focusing really on the tabernacle. If you need a Bible, raise your hands. The ushers are going to be, we'll give one to you so that you can follow along. We're going to be in Exodus 26. The last few weeks, um, speaking of the tabernacle, uh, last week, we looked at the veil, the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And the veil uh, was made of, of three different colors. It was a blue, a purple, and scarlet. And the fact that each of these spoke of a specific element or specific aspect of Jesus. Remember, every element of the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything in the tabernacle points to Jesus. Even tonight, as we're going to talk about the door, points to Jesus. And some of that may be a little bit more obvious, uh, some of it less obvious. But the blue that was in the veil, we're going to see tonight, speaking of heaven. The purple, speaking of royal or royal judgment. And the scarlet of redemptive sacrifice. And we looked at the, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about that toll-off form, which is just so incredible, how God hides the gospel in nature. The gospel is hidden in nature. It's actually, as we examine the scriptures and we examine science, we see this this scarlet-covered worm that crawls up on a tree and dies with a big red spot, and then the red blood basically turns into white flakes that flake off white as snow. A great picture of Jesus dying and then washing away our sins, making us white as snow. But, but the tabernacle, those are those, those pictures and those things that we looked at in the next screen, the toll-off worm, um, that, that beautiful picture that's in nature that points to the gospel and shows the gospel. Um, and then, uh, you know, the thing I like to always kind of backtrack and, and to talk about is what does the tabernacle, we kind of lose perspective on how big the tabernacle is or how little the tabernacle is. We think, wow, there's two and a half million people surrounding the tabernacle. This tabernacle must be big. No, it's not. It's, it's 15 feet wide and 45 feet long. In fact, that's, that's the, the tabernacle itself. Remember, and of course, it's covered with seal skins, you know, these, these badger skins. It, it it's, has no desire, you know, no, no comeliness, nothing that we should desire it, just like Jesus. It just looks pretty normal on the outside. But when you step inside, all the gold, all the ornate things, the craftsman's design, and of course, in all of it, all of it points to Jesus. On the outside, he looks normal. On the inside, he's God. Amazing. And it's, so this tabernacle is 15 feet wide, 15 feet tall, 45 feet long. The Holy of Holies is a cube, 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. And at that Holy of Holies, we've looked at some of the elements there, um, really, once again, pointing to Jesus, pointing to the, the mercy seat where God would be enthroned, where he would meet, and meet with his people. The whole tabernacle is speaking of where God wants to meet with us. We looked at the veil, which is that, the thing in the middle there, and it has the cherubim, the angels on it, and it's got the blue, the scarlet, the purple, the, and purple. 
And, and that veil that was hung by four pillars. And we looked at last week the fact that those four pillars represent four Gospels. Remember, the veil, it says in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, is his flesh. Jesus, it's his flesh. And the veil is held up by four pillars, which are the four Gospels, that hold up Jesus in the flesh, that hold up God in the flesh. It's amazing. Amazing. That's what the veil is. And that veil, of course, was separated, torn apart from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross, all speaking of what Jesus would do. Well, we pick up then in Exodus 26, and we're going to finish out the chapter. We're going to move really fast and cover a whole two verses tonight. <laughs> verses 36 and 37. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Yeah. You're going to hear a whole message on those two verses. And you're like, huh, really? This is the crazy thing. The Old Testament, we can read, you know, our Bible. And this is the place, especially in the Old Testament, where we can get bogged down and we just kind of like, okay, bronze and scarlet and okay chapter 27 let's go on the next thing is there anything interesting in 27 and and, and we kind of just read through it and it's like especially when we get to certain parts we're like what's the point what's the point of this what is this trying to say well remember if we put jesus in the center of it it starts to make a lot of sense see what we have here in colossians 2 um, amazing little passage here. Colossians 2. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. See, there's a mystery in the Old Testament, and it's revealed in the New Testament. Mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We don't realize it, but these little verses, they, they, on the surface, they seem like, well, they're just Okay, here's what it's supposed to look like. Here's the building plans. Here's the blueprint. But we don't realize that this blueprint, once again, is pointing to Jesus and showing us details of his love, of God's love, of his character, of who he is. The New Testament, you may have heard this before. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, but the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. In other words, the, New, the Old Testament has the New Testament in it. It's just concealed. It's just hidden. In fact, it talks about a veil that was over the, the Israelites. It was over Moses, so they couldn't quite understand it. They couldn't quite grasp it. And yet the New Testament just it basically explains it. It's like, oh, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. And we're going to see the New Testament explaining and expounding these verses. So look at that again, Exodus 26, 36. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. Okay, we already talked about blue represents heaven. And the reason blue represents heaven, you guys are in Florida. What's the most blue thing you see all the time? Water. No. <laughs> the sky. Not water, but the sky, okay? Now, the sky, you know, you may not have, not everybody has water. They Remember, they lived in the desert, so they didn't have water. But they did have the sky, and the sky was generally blue. And the sky is generally blue pretty much throughout most of the, the world, except Seattle, where it's gray, all year round, okay? Um, almost, I, I, I visited Seattle and I visited, they had like, had 84 days without sun. And the day I visited, it sun, it, the sun came out. And, and I felt good, I, they, everybody was smiling. I was like, this, is, this place is beautiful. They're like, yeah, you haven't suffered the last 84 days of rain. And, but God gives us that picture. Heaven is above us and it's blue. And so when we see blue in the Bible, usually it's referring to some kind of heavenly overtones or heavenly focus. And purple, of course, is that color of royalty. Um, in fact, purple was a very hard color. Today, it's like we have dyes and it's no big deal. But we don't realize that back then, purple was very valuable because of the, what they had to find, the, the, the ways that they had to create the purple color. It was expensive. So only the kings, the royalty, could have purple. And, of course, scarlet, we've already talked about that scarlet looking at the same picture, the image of blood sacrifice. And so, just like the veil, the same three colors, blue, purple, and scarlet, are, are what the veil, or the, rather the screen, for the door. Now, we, we kind of think of this door, it's, it's a little bit confusing. It's not your typical door. Remember, they lived in tents, and this tent has a 15 by 15 foot opening. Basically, to give you perspective, it's about pretty much the width of this small stage, that's how big the tabernacle is. That's, that's, it's only that wide. Now, it's also that tall and then 45 feet long. Now, 
Um, so it's this wide, and basically there are um, the description here is it's like a screen that covers it. You know, I had to think about the, the dust and the desert and, and, and the sand and everything. So it's not like a traditional door at all. But it's this screen or, or blanket, if you will, a, a, not a thick blanket. Remember, the, the veil had a very thick um, blanket-like material, especially when we got to the temple where it was four to six inches thick. I mean, it's huge. It took 300 people, 300 priests to lift the veil in the temple. Okay? And the tabernacle was a predecessor, was before we get to the temple. The, the tabernacle was basically the mobile temple in the wilderness. Well, here we have this, um, this door of this tent. Um, and it basically, the, what we know too, besides it being 15 by 15, is that it faces east. And why does it face east? Well, because the sun rises in the east. It's facing the east. In fact, the, the eastern gate is where the Messiah is going to come from. The idea that the east, it's, it, the east everything points, everything, everything's to look to the east because we want to see the sun, the sun rise. Not just the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. And that idea of the sun coming up. And so this gate faced east. It's interesting, this gate, or this, this door rather, um, didn't have cherubim. The veil had cherubim. The veil had cherubim. Remember those angels. But the door here has no cherubim. And why is that? Facing east, um, the, the Bible really kind of gives us, gives us some clarity. Genesis 3, 24, in the garden... When they were kicked out of the garden, when they sinned, they were kicked out to the east. Verse 24, so God drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what was really going on here? When they were kicked out of the garden, cherubim guarded the way, guarded the way, so they couldn't get back in. And, and part of that was like, why didn't God want them to get back in? Because God didn't want them in their fallen state to, t to eat of the tree of eternal life and be stuck forever separated from him. He was going to provide a sacrifice. He already had a plan. It wasn't that they, they fell, okay, God's got plan B. No, he knew the whole, he had the whole plan from the beginning. But he had to guard the way because it wasn't, it wasn't possible for them. It wasn't safe for them to come back into the garden. So there, was, there were cherubim, there were angels that were guarding the way. The same thing then is on the veil into the, go, into the most holy place. But the holy place, remember, is a picture of Jesus. And Jesus comes as a humble servant. There are no angels. For, for when Jesus, in, in that sense of Jesus, he's coming and he's, he's coming open so that anyone may come. There's no angel with a flaming sword guarding the entrance to the tabernacle. It's like Revelation 22 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Let who, him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The door of the tabernacle, this veil, or this, this, this screen, was basically, there was nothing blocking it. There was nothing to scare you away. And that's the way Jesus is. There's nothing to turn you away. Jesus is just, he's humble. He's there, and he's like, come. In fact, the scripture says, you know the scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever, whoever, whoever, it's open. The path is open. Now, the, the, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was, was limited to the priests, Moses and Joshua. But the tabernacle today is open to whosoever, whosoever, whoever wants to come, whoever wants to taste of eternal life, whoever wants to drink of eternal life, the water of eternal life, it's open. The door's open. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. It's there. It's available to anyone. You may think that you've fallen. You may think that you've messed up too bad. I've, I've, I've committed the unforgivable sin, and God won't accept me. No, that's the point, is that God is saying there's nothing separating you except you. He's there. He wants to make you. He, he's making himself available. And this, this screen of the door is simply that. It's open to whoever. No angel is guarding it. Back in Exodus 26, and you shall make the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Now, this is one of those things that it's hard for us to grasp because acacia wood is not something that we deal with a lot. Um, and um, unless you're wealthy, you probably don't deal with gold a lot either. <laughs> um, and then it says sockets of bronze and stuff. It's like, what, what is all this? Okay, remember, the, the acacia wood was a wood that they found in the desert that doesn't rot. It's really interesting. You know, a lot of wood rots. Here in Florida, most wood is going to rot. 
We got to pressure treat it. We got to do these things. We got to paint it. We do these things to keep it from rotting. Acacia wood, God designed so that it wouldn't rot. And gold, of course, pure gold, like, you know, your 14 karat is not pure gold, but 24 karat gold is pure gold and it won't rust. It won't tarnish. And so the, the, the acacia wood speaking of Christ's humanity, the gold speaking of his deity, and of course Psalm 16.10 says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. God wanted to make sure um, that Jesus was not going to go rot in the tomb. And it's the same way he's, he's not, the, the, the tabernacle is not going to rot in the wilderness as they travel through the wilderness. It's made of stuff that won't rot. It's made of stuff that won't rust. And Jesus, it's all pointing, once again, to Jesus. It's pointing also to the fact that it's, it's wood overlaid with gold. The idea of Jesus, God the Son. Speaking of divinity, speaking of his, his deity. Well, it says that there are five pillars. We said that the veil, remember, this, the contrast here is always between the veil and the door. Okay, So the veil had four pillars, and we looked at the four pillars, and we said those were the four Gospels. The five pillars here... Speak of five, of course, always speaking of the number of grace. But my helpers ahead of me. Those five, anybody know what those five names are? I know those names are the, those are the five names. Who, who are they besides, I mean, what, what do they have in common? Uh, I heard somebody say writing. Those are the ones that wrote the, the epistles. There are five people that wrote epistles. So there are four Gospels, four testimonies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But then there are five epistles that explain the Gospel to the world. And so there are five pillars that are held up, that are holding up the door. Now, you may say, okay, that's kind of interesting. But the Word of God also points to those people as five pillars. Galatians 2.9 says, and when James, this is, P, this is Paul writing about these guys. He says that when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to me pillars... Perceive the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they, be, and they to the circumcised. There's five. There's five. The four pillars that hold up the veil, but there's five pillars that are holding up the door. And those, that's the explanation of the gospel as, as Jesus is lifted up, as he's being held up. It's, it's explained by these, gospel, or these uh, epistle writers. And five, once again, also the number of grace. Speaking of grace, the door is being held up by grace. Anybody who wants to come in can. Anybody. Anybody. Exodus 26, 37. You shall make the screen five pillars of acacia wood, overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze. Now, this is the first time in this section that we get to bronze. Now, what's bronze have to do with anything? Bronze always speaks of judgment. Okay, gold is deity. Silver is redemption. Okay, remember that 30 pieces of silver is what Jesus was betrayed for. He, he, was re he redeems us, uh, and silver is always speaking of redemption, but bronze is speaking of judgment or testing. So the veil, the veil had four sockets of silver in the holy of holies, or in the holy place and the holy of holies, it was silver and gold. When we get outside, it's going to be bronze. The focus is going to be on bronze, because bronze is the place of testing, of trial, of judgment. And Jesus, of course, was tried, and he was tested, and he was found without sin and blameless. Right outside, um, the other thing, too, there are, since there are five that are holding it up, remember, there's four on the veil, but there's five on, on the door. That means, you know, you've, you know, you got one, two, three, four, five. So what happens is there's actually a narrower entrance to the front door than there is to the Holy of Holies. There were four. You know, so if you've got four pillars back here, it's the same width, four pillars. The entrance there is going to be a little bit wider. The entrance in the front here at the door, though, is narrow. And, of course, we know that the door, the, the, gate, the gate is narrow. Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate. In other words, if you want to come into the tabernacle, you've got to come in the one way. There's only one door in the tabernacle, only one door. And in fact, today, if we tried to build the tabernacle, the county wouldn't let us because it doesn't meet code. There's no fire escape. There's no, there's no windows. There's only one door. That's a hazard. The point is, there's only one way. The, the, the gate is narrow. Enter by the narrow gate, Matthew 7, 13. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. 
Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Okay, it's really interesting. He starts talking about the gate. The gate's narrow. We know there's only one way to God. But then he immediately starts talking about the narrow gate, and then he goes from the narrow gate to the false prophets. Why does he do that? Because the false prophets are going to say there's other ways to God. There's other ways to get in the tabernacle. You know, we can just lift up the, lift up the side and we'll sneak in. You know, actually, maybe we can tunnel in. We'll find a way. We'll tunnel in. It'll be really cool because when you go underground, it stays cool down there, you know. And it's amazing. Today, the church is in a, one of the most dangerous places it could be because there's so much deception. There's so many false prophets out there. I have a little video I want to show you. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. La mayor parte de La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, Hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes. Que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. The Pope video. There you have it. Now, you may say, oh, I believe in love. Hey, we're all children of God. We're all, we're all His creation. And it sounds great. But Jesus has something different to say. His, his, what he says is, uh, is a little different. It, John 8, I know that you're able, this is Jesus, and he's dialoguing with the Pharisees, okay? He's, he's having this dialogue with the Pharisees, and they're, they're really pushing back against him. What are you doing here, Jesus? And they, basically Jesus says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, speaking to the Pharisees, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then he said to them, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Okay, so first off, he immediately, Jesus begins and says, I know you're descendants of Abraham. But he basically says you're not really his children. Because if you're children of Abraham, you would do what Abraham did. Abraham had faith, and Abraham believed in God. But they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in his testimony. So Jesus is kind of challenging them. And he says, he's not your father. You do the deeds of your father. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have one father. Our father is God. We're not born of fornication, which is a, a dig at Jesus. Because remember, Jesus... You know, they didn't believe that Jesus was born of God. They just believed that he was an illegitimate son, that he was born out of wedlock. So when, when in verse 41, you know, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. So now they're, they're saying, well, God's our father. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, 
and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus basically says, you're not a child of God. That's what Jesus basically told the Pharisees. Pharisees, you're not a child of God. You're actually a child of the devil. I don't know if the Pope likes that message. The, the message the Pope just said was so, it sounds so good, it sounds so nice, it sounds like, well, yeah, we're all, we're all related, you know, we're human, we're, we, we're, we're humanity, we are tied together, yes. We're related actually through Noah, okay? You go back far enough, we all connect to Noah. But that doesn't mean that we're all children of God. Biblically speaking, only those who are born of God. In fact, John 1, uh, 12, but as many as received him, received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You are not a child of God until you put your faith and trust in Jesus. And so many world religions, they, well, we will come together and we, you know, I believe in love, like they said. I believe in love. I believe in love. I believe in love. Okay, what are you going to do with that? What, what, what kind of love? I love ice cream. I love my shoes, I love my wife, I love you guys, but those are different types of love. We're not even talking about the same thing yet. How do I know what you're talking about? And then we're going to say that we all worship the same God? Whoa, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Anybody, that, if you've done any serious study on Islam, for example, Allah was, was, is the moon god. And he's the moon god is because he's the god of the dark, god of the night. It's, it's really worship of Satan. How can you say that's the same God? Oh, well, because Allah means God. And, and, the, and, and, and when you go to, to um, Arabic-speaking countries, they translate the Bible, and anywhere it says God, they use the word Allah. Yeah, that's, the, the, that's a problem. That's part of the stumbling block for those people to receive Christ is because they've, tried, they've connected it. And that's why there's this whole movement in the church today called Chrislam, which is bringing the Christ with Islam and merging the two. The Bible says there is one door. The door is narrow. That's the only way in. You can't get in any other way. You can't come in the back door. You can't rappel in from the roof. There's no skylight. There's only one door. And that's what the Bible is continuing to say over and over again. Jesus himself said, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes. That's Jesus. That's narrow. Why do you have to be so narrow? And you, know, you may have been told that as a Christian. You're just so narrow. Christians, you're so narrow. Uh, you know what? Jesus is narrow. I'm just, just saying what he said. That's what he said. And, and the problem with people, that they, a lot of people like Jesus. But that's because they've never read the Bible. I remember I was on, on a plane coming back uh, to Florida, and I was sitting next to a guy and just started you know, trying to love him and share the gospel with him. And, and, and he, got, he got a little bit you know, offended because I was sharing the gospel that he needed Jesus. And he said, well, you know, if the world just lived by the Sermon on the Mount, it, the, world, you know, the, the world would be a, greater, a much better place. I said, I agree with you. And he looked at me like I was like, how can we agree on anything? Because we're not agreeing. And then I, I took him to the Sermon on the Mount, and I read some things. That if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. That if you, if you have evil intents towards your brother, you've murdered him. And, he, and I said... Have you, ever, um, have you ever had been angry with your brother? He's like, yeah. So you've, you're guilty of murder. But, but Jesus isn't talking about that. He's not talking about me. He's talking about somebody else. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. When you bring people to the word of God, the first thing they say is, well, that doesn't apply to me. Right. Really? No, that's the whole thing. It does apply to you. What think, what, why do you think that you get a free pass? Why do you think that you get, that you get, a, get out of the jail card free? That, that, well, yes, God loves you, but he loves the others too. And it applies. In fact, the word of God says at the, very end, at the, end, of chapter four, at the end of chapter five, still in the Sermon on the Mount, it, it's like half, about a third of the way through the Sermon on the Mount, it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I showed that to the guy, and he's like, well, and then he, then he went off. He's like, he, you know, he didn't like what I was saying. And I'm like, I'm just showing you what the Bible says. I'm just showing you what Jesus says. That no one is good. The whole point of the Sermon on the Mount, all Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount, he's taking the Ten Commandments and he's amplifying it for today's audience to show that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. That none of us can, none of us can rise up to the standard. And so that's why we need grace. That's why we need to fall at the, the feet of Jesus and say, I need you. I can't do this. 
That's, what the, whole, that's the whole purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. People like the, the, the first part, blessed are those and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, the, the, the very second one. I love the New, the new Living Translation of 5-4, of you know, blessed are those who mourn. The, the New Living says, blessed are those who realize their need for him, for the kingdom of God is given to them. That's the gospel. That is the Sermon on the Mount. But people want to take and they want to pick and choose and they want to say, well, we just, can't we just all get along? We live in such a bad world and, and, and there's, you know, Islam is... is is, um, is, not, is, is a religion of peace, and, and therefore, you know, we just need to recognize that. And if, and if we recognize that, then the really radical Muslims wouldn't have such a big deal with us. No, here's the problem. Here's a reality check. Even if you say religion, if Islam is a religion of peace, the radical fundamentalist um, Muslims will still hate you and will still want to take you out. No matter how far you go in trying to make, make concessions to them and try to love them and try to reach out to them, they will hate you. They will hate you because their doctrine is, of the radical fundamentalist, their doctrine is that, that um, if you don't convert to Islam, if you don't believe that Muhammad was God's prophet, that you're deserving of death. There, there's, there's no negotiation. There's no changing the, the, the Quran. We don't realize that, that the Quran is basically enshrining or immortalizing 8th century, 7th, 7th and 8th century Arabic culture. That's why they still walk around in the, the hijab and the, the, all this, the burqa and all this stuff. They walk around in that because they've, they've taken what, what, what was happening to Muhammad back in that time and saying this is the way it should be forever. This is also the reason why Islam is not... Um, melding in with the cultures, you know, um, you know, America's a great melting pot, which works as long as the cultures melt together. Well, with Islam, especially radical Islam, they don't want to melt together. They want you to melt. They want you to change. And it's not going to work. It's not going to work, and it's going to continue to bring conflict. And Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm sorry you can't get there through Buddha. You can't get there through Confucius. You can't get there through being a good person. You can't get there in your own way. You can only get there through Jesus. I, amen. I don't, and I don't mean to, ma to bash on, on the Pope, but, we need, but the Bible says in that earlier passage there um, was that, in, um, in Matthew 7, the narrow gate, the narrow way, and then he goes right to that talking about those that would lead us astray. We have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of that. We can't just receive anything because it comes from somebody that, that seems sincere. Sincerity is not the test of truth. The Bible is a test of truth. We go back to the Bible, and we go back, and does it line up with the word of God? That's how we test truth, not the sincerity of an individual. You can be sincerely wrong. So, one door, no fire escape, no way out. Luke 13. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where, are you, where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. The, dark, the door, speaking of the door, Jesus is that door. And there will come a time where the door is not just going to be a screen, where the door will be closed. The door will be closed. And there will be people that say, you know, you know, I, I think I, I, want, I want to try this again. Can I come in? And Jesus is like, no, it's too late. And as I was praying about this message, one of the things that, that hit me, you know, our Wednesday night crew, you guys, are the, you guys are the diehards. You know, you're here going through the book of Exodus. Like, really, who's going to go through the book of Exodus, Right? You, you must really love the Word of God. You must be really bored and not have anything else to do on Wednesday night. The TV, there must be nothing on TV on Wednesday nights. I don't even know. Is there anything? I, point being, you guys are here. You're serious. But here's the deal. My, my heart's cry 
is that I believe there are some that are here tonight that if the rapture were to happen, that you would be outside the door knocking saying, God, let me in. If the rapture were to happen tonight, it, it, it's over. That, that was, you missed it. You missed it. There are, the, there are those who said that, that we, we saw you. We saw what you did. You taught, we ate and drank in your presence. We, we took communion. We attended Reveal. We attended Reveal a couple times a week. And God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I don't, I don't know you. My dwelling place, the whole, the whole focus of this series is the focus on relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the, is, he's the door. He's the key. We've got to come through him. And there's some of you that have, not, have never done that. You've never done that. I don't want you to be outside knocking. In fact, even today, right now, Jesus is knocking on your heart. He's knocking on your door. Revelation 3.20 this is Jesus speaking. Jesus is outside the church of Laodicea because they've been a carnal church. And he's speaking to them. And he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. God desires relationship with us. He desires to come in. But we've got to open the door. We've got to open the door. We've got to come through the door. We've got to come through the way he said. And, we, and so many of us... We wrestle with this and we say, well, but I don't like that door. I don't like the colors on that door. I don't like the way you did that gospel presentation. I don't, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. I don't like the way that this is done. I don't like the way. That doesn't matter. What matters is Jesus says the door is here. And if you want to come, it's open. It's available to anybody. Whosoever wills, come eat freely. Come drink. Taste the water. But you've got to come. You've got to come. The last call. There are some here tonight that have not come. You've, you've, you've signed a card. You've raised your hand. But in your heart, you're still outside. You're still outside. The only thing that's separating you from God is you. It's you. Do you want to be there on that last day? Right now, even if you're thinking, I wonder if I'm, he's talking to me. If you're asking that question right now, if you're asking that question, I wonder if he's talking to me. I'm talking to you. Because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get right. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know. We don't know. The, the, I'm doing another funeral in a couple weeks. And, and I hate doing funerals. But it's a constant reminder that life is frail. I don't know how many days I have left. Somebody was just sharing with me uh, on, on the way here that their friend died, 45 years old, died of a degenerative disease. 45. That's young. Don't we have technology? Don't we have science that can fix that? People that are killed, kids that are killed in car accidents today. None of us knows what tomorrow holds. The door is here. Jesus is that door, and he says, come to me, all who are weary. Come, taste and see. Our application tonight, are you trying to make your own door? Are you trying to build your own door and construct it in a way that you like? You don't like the blue, the, the, the scarlet and the purple? Are you, you're inside, but you're still trying to redecorate God's tabernacle. Maybe that's you. You know, it'd be better, God, if you did it this way. Or, or you're trying to redecorate because you're trying to say, well, you know, this is pretty cool, but... God, I want to keep you at, my, at, at arm's length because I'm scared of getting close to you. You know, the whole thing, of the, there's, you, you enter, you, you know, here's the door, and we enter into the tabernacle, but then there's the holy of holies that going in deeper, and so many of us are still outside. That, that's for like the really serious people like Pastor Dave. No, it's for everybody. The veil is open. In fact, the veil is open and you can see in and, and God's saying, come. But you, if you haven't come through the first door, you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. But God wants you to come. He wants you. You don't know how many seconds you have left. But then when you come inside, how many are still on the outside looking in and, oh, that, yeah, I, I wish I had a close relationship with God like, you know, Pastor Dave or Pastor Jacob or, or this person or that person. The door is open. The veil has been torn. Anybody can come. Anybody can come. 
Jesus is the door to life. He's the door to salvation. He's the door to joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is amazing. Lord, we see Jesus on every page. And yet there are some here tonight that are, are having their hearts quickened. They're opening. They're beginning to see you for the first time. And yet they have a choice to make, whether to embrace you, whether to accept you, receive you, or whether to harden their heart again. God, right now, I pray for that person. I pray for that woman. I pray for that man that's wrestling. Lord, I pray for the person that's not even wrestling, that's just oblivious. They're blind. They're deaf. They can't hear the message. Lord, that you'd open their ears, unstop their ears to hear the truth that they need you. That they'd not be deceived by another message, by a false message, by the false shepherd. That they would hear your voice, Lord, right now, right here in this place. Speak, Lord. With every eye closed, every heart focused on him. If you're here tonight and you've not entered the door, you've not entered the tabernacle, maybe you've prayed a prayer in the past, maybe you've raised a hand, maybe you've come forward in the past, but inside your heart you're wrestling and you're like, you're not sure. God is saying today, today you can be set free. Today you can enter in and begin fellowship and communion with him. Today that's you and you want to do that we serve an amazing God a loving God that opens and says whosoever wills can come in if that's you simply raise a hand to the Lord right now praise the Lord praise God anyone else praise the Lord anyone else there's a battle going on right now some of you are still you're wanting me to finish because you're just uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, it's because you're not right with God. If you're uncomfortable right now, it's because you're not right with God and he wants to have fellowship with you. He's standing at the door. He's knocking. Are you going to leave him there? Or are you going to open the door of your heart? Anybody else? Anybody else? Raise your hand right now. Anybody else? Anyone? Praise God. Praise God. If you raised your hand just to, during this time, right now it's important that you do business with God. There were a bunch of hands that went up, so you're not alone. But more importantly, Jesus is right here, and he wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to dine with you. He wants to come in and into your life and, and, and help you and, and, and set you free. So right now, it's really about you doing business. It's not about repeating a prayer after me. It's not about joining this church. It's about surrendering your heart and say, God, I'm tired of doing my own thing. I'm tired of doing it my own way. I want to come through the one narrow door. I want to come through you. Right now, in your heart of heart, offer your own prayer to him and be restored. And offer your own prayer to him and find fellowship with him. Find communion with him. Find that you are loved because you are Right now, offer your own prayer. Thank you, God. I thank you for each person that raised their hand, and that was the first step of faith. The next step of that is that next prayer. And Lord, I pray that they did business with you, and that they would recognize that there's nothing more that they have to do to receive salvation. There's nothing more that they have to, to try harder or, or to be better because we can't. We can't do it. But, Lord, right now that your Holy Spirit would fill each one of them, that you would come into them, that they would know that they'd have assurance of salvation, recognizing simply that if they confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God has raised him from the dead, your word says they will be saved. Make it, make it secure. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word and that it all points to you. God, take us deeper. Take us deeper into the holy of holies, day by day, moment by moment. In Jesus' name, amen.